in the spring of 1986, I was 15 years old, living in Belleville, New Jersey, and attending a public high school. I was the only Egyptian Muslim student that I knew of attending the school. I knew of one other Muslim family in the town, but we weren't necessarily friends, and they certainly weren't my age. I was being raised to follow the strict interpretation of the Muslim faith. No hanging out with my friends outside of the school setting, no boyfriend, no sports, and no joining clubs. The extrovert in me, who only wanted to fit in, longed to be a part of all of these United States American teenage pursuits. I was watching all of this unfold in 80s movies and on television, the prom, football games, cheerleading, none of it was I allowed to take part in. It was in the spring of 1986 that the song Greatest Love of All was released, sung by Whitney Houston. For those of you unfamiliar with the song, here's an excerpt of the lyrics. Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone who fulfilled my needs, a lonely place to be. And so I learned to depend on me. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I'll live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity because the greatest love of all is happening to me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. I remember crying when I first heard this song and at the time watched the video on MTV. Eventually, after the maybe 200th listening of this song, I stopped crying and started belting it out when it played, wanting so badly to absorb the message, to learn to love myself. I didn't have role models for how I was living, an isolated immigrant with customs, a language, and a religion that was often questioned and worse ridiculed by some in my high school. I wanted so badly to believe that learning to love myself was easy to achieve. It wasn't though. It took many, many years and lots of therapy and soul searching to arrive at a place of truly loving myself, of what Sonia Renee Taylor in her book, The Body's Not an Apology, calls radical self-love. What I didn't know about this song, Greatest Love of All, but discovered when I was Googling the lyrics so that I could quote them um, accurately, is that while it became wildly popular by Whitney Houston, the lyrics were written by Linda Creed in the 70s to play during the opening credits of the 1977 film, Greatest, a biopic by the boxer Muhammad Ali which depicts Ali's life from the 1960s Summer Olympics to his regaining the heavyweight crown from George Foreman in their famous Rumble in the Jungle fight in 1974. The writer, Linda Creed, had been diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 26 and wrote the lyrics of this song while battling the disease. According to her Wikipedia page, quote, the words describe her feelings about coping with great challenges that one must face in life, being strong during those challenges, whether you succeed or fail, and passing that strength on to children to carry with them into their adult lives. The song begins, children are our future. Linda died at the tender age of 37, leaving behind a spouse and two children. Now, of course, the namesake of the movie, The Greatest, is Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali himself is an awe-inspiring example of radical self-love, even in the face of so much adversity in the form of white supremacy and anti-Black racism. I didn't know any of this as I turned to this song over and over for decades. I would listen, wanting inspiration and a reminder that I really did need to love myself. 
But over the years, learning to love myself has taken on different manifestations. When I first got married at 22, just two weeks shy of my 23rd birthday, learning to love myself meant not losing myself to my spouse. When I became a mother, first at the age of 27 and then again at the age of 30, learning to love myself meant not losing myself to my children. When I became single again at the age of 50, learning to love myself means to be self-connected and moving through pain and discomfort. What does it mean to be self-connected? What I'm learning at the age of 51 is that self-connection, well, it means many things. The first is not to seek external validation. If I seek validation for who I am externally from the external world, then I will be invalidated. So many things seek to invalidate who I am as a woman of color, an immigrant, a middle-aged single woman, as an outspoken faith leader. I validate myself by learning to move through pain and discomfort, by taking the time to feel the pain rather than try and distract from it. This means I am honest with myself about being in pain and not giving in to the unhelpful toxic positivity movement by saying things like, well, it's not that bad, or at least. Instead, I have learned to offer myself compassion and self-empathy and most of all grace. When I am in pain, I think about what I would say to another person who is experiencing emotional pain. I would never say, well, it's not that bad. No, I would offer empathy, compassion, and space for that person to feel what needs to be felt. We say things to ourselves that is so sometimes hurtful and harmful that we would never say to another person, especially someone we loved. And we need to learn to love ourselves. To do this for myself, I'm learning self-connection through journaling, through talking with friends, close friends who I trust and are my support, and even through letting myself have a good cry maybe watching a sad movie or listening to a sad song, a good cry for me ends up proving cathartic instead of avoiding pain. I connect to it and know that the only way out is through. Giving ourselves space to experience all the emotions that accompany this gift called, called life offers us the chance to connect with ourselves fully and authentically. We are self-connected when we connect to our feelings, when we resist feelings of sadness, despair, and pain, we suffer. And we prolong our suffering and cause disconnection from why we are feeling this pain. Often what we struggle with managing is our grief. These past years, as we navigate this global pandemic, we have grieved so much, so much death, so much loss, loss of loved ones, loss of time spent together, loss of what could have been. I read once grief described as love having nowhere to go. We learn to move through grief by expanding our holding of this love. We don't ever truly let go of grief. We simply learn to live with it and hold all the love that we have. Being self-connected is one way to navigate through grief. To be clear, being self-connected is not a way to avoid pain or grief. On the contrary, being self-connected means we feel these emotions deeply. One of the gifts of being part of a faith community, of being part of the Unitarian Universalist community, that is the Church of the Larger Fellowship, is that no matter where you are, you, you can, we gather in prayer, we gather in community to hold each other in grief. Self-connection also brings the opportunity for us to feel 
joy, compassion, and love much more brightly and authentically when we are self-connected. When we show up for ourselves fully and authentically, we show up for others fully and authentically. I will leave you with two more readings from a book that I highly recommend, Inward by Young Pueblo. Anyone who is willing to know themselves, to face themselves and all beings without condition is a hero who is adding to the collective peace of humanity. And finally, I can only give to you what I already have given to myself. I can only understand the world as much as I understand myself. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be.